good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all our viewers who have joined in from different parts of the world and different time zones. Welcome to RISE 2024. Once again, 11 years running now, we have come back to you with global thought leaders uh, talking about you know, their, their efforts and their thoughts on a lot of issues concerning the world and looking at various ways of you know, engaging with each other in, in con conversations and collaborations. And to take this one step ahead, uh, we have a fireside chat today with somebody who is not only experienced, but extremely inspirational, whose life journey is as interesting and exciting as the kind of revolution that he has brought about in the area of agriculture. Uh, we would like to uh, all of you to put your hands together for none, none other than Mayank Gandhi. A brief introduction to Mayank before we get on to this very, I, I hope will be a very interesting chat. Uh, Mayank Gandhi <clears throat> sorry, was an international urban planner who turned into a social activist. He was earlier a core member of India Against Corruption movement in India and part of the national executive of the Aam Aadmi Party. But in 2016, he quit politics completely and started his own NGO, Global Vikas Trust, to work in some of the worst areas of India for farmer welfare. Since then, GBT has been working to multiply farmer incomes astronomically. We'll hear more about that in the chat. Uh, with his model of changing cropping pattern, he has been successful in removing over 22,000 farmer families from the poverty trap in over 4,000 villages in Maharashtra and Madhya Pradesh. And uh, there is one more interesting uh, you know, aspect that he's added to this to make this whole project sustainable and replicable, a new state-of-the-art Prishikul Farmer Training Center. We'll learn all about this and many, many more aspects about Mayang Gandhi, the person, and Mayang Gandhi, his work. Uh, in this chat. So welcome, Mayank. It's wonderful to have you on the RISE platform. It's great to be here. I look forward to chatting with you. Thank you, Mayank. It's, it's really exciting to finally have you with us. And uh, in, these, in, this, uh, next, in the next few minutes, half an hour or so, we hopefully will try to get a little sense of uh, all the wonderful, magical things that you have been doing on the ground. Right? So let's start briefly uh, with your general journey. I mean, it's, it's an amazing transformation. You moved from the, the corporate world uh, into, you know, uh, you know, citizen activism, a social activist, and then you kind of uh, well, was a flag bearer for political renaissance in this country, and then you shifted gears altogether, and now you're a champion for, uh, you know, agricultural, sustainable agriculture, as well as uh, a farmers' prosperity and livelihood. Uh, how did this transformation take place? I know it's a broad question, trying to sum up your life in the next few minutes, but yes, how, how did that transformation take place? Okay, so I was an international urban planner and I used to work in developed countries. And when I saw the lives of the common people there living with dignity, I said, can we do that in India? So I started working in India on governance reforms because the desire, I'm, I'm fond of drawing on a larger canvas. I just cannot draw on a small canvas. So my desire was, how do I transform this great country a country till the 1700 was had 33% of the global economy and 30% of the global trade. And today we are just a fraction of that. We are 2.38% of the global economy. So how do you transform this country? And I felt governance reforms was the way forward. So there was one uh, gentleman called Anna Azare, who was a social activist. Uh, and uh, I started working in, and we drafted the some of the governance reforms, the right to information, and many other laws, which I felt would be uh, impactful and which would bring back the power in citizens to do things, like the right to information. Some of the biggest corruption has come out because of the right to information. And today, the power west in the people in uh, who, who have positions, I wanted the power to rest in the citizens, that they could do something. So right to information was one, many other laws like this. So I worked with him, we drafted that. And then post that we, uh, I worked on many other governance reforms. But at one stage I felt working with NGOs and working with activists that these people are as petty as the rest of the world. And just because you become an activist or a NGO does not change your innate character. And I felt a little disillusioned and I went out of that uh, aspect of uh, working on governance reforms. 
unfortunately, you remember that we had been attacked in Taj and Oberoi. I think that was in 2008. Eight. Yeah. So I saw all of that on television and I said, I can't stay away. I need to go there, whatever the issues. So I went back to public life. I started working on uh, different kind of reforms in the country. And then uh, in 2003, I worked with Anandare for this. And then in 2011, I joined up with Arvind Kejriwal and Anna Azare. I remember there was a meeting, public meeting, where I was presiding, where Arvind was one of the speaker, Arvind Kejriwal. And he told me that he, Prashant Bhushan, Shanti Bhushan and Santosh Hegde, had drafted a law against corruption and that they wanted to make it into a public movement. And he told me that I should take the lead in the western part of the country. So at that time, I was deep into spiritual practices. My journey was within. Uh, so I refused that I will not be able to join. But Kejriwal being Kejriwal, he announced in a press conference that I will take the leadership. Uh, so I felt that maybe this is destined and I should do something for others rather than just for self-realization. So I introduced him to Anazar and then we all figured out how to create a big movements which would transform the political narrative and the political dimensions of this country in a positive way. And we made it into a massive movement. You know about that movement. So I don't need to go into that, but it became one of the biggest movements post-independence. Then at some stage, we started realizing just having this uh, movement may not be enough to transform the country. And we need to make a political party and show the might of the people through the electoral process. And we started a morphed into a political party called Ahmadmi Party. So as part of the core committee of the India Against Corruption, I became a national executive. Uh, I have this habit of not taking any position. So I always be part of a group rather than uh, take up a position. So, and uh, you know that a lot of things happened in this country because of this movement and because of forming this party. In 2014, Azare, Modi ji won the national election and started winning state after state. So I remember calling for a press conference and challenging him and saying that you are Ashwamekka Goda, I will stop at Delhi. And we campaigned heavily and we won unprecedented 67 out of 70 seats in Delhi. But post that election, I started seeing that this party was taking a path which we had not planned. We were more going for power rather than principles. And I felt that I was not suitable to be in electoral day-to-day -day politics because they have certain working patterns which I was not happy with or I did not know how to do it. So I quit politics. And Osho used to say that in life there is richness and there is poverty. We need to choose. And I felt electoral politics was extreme poverty. And I did not want to spend the rest of my life doing this kind of a work. So I quit politics. But the desire to transform the country was still there, burning within my bosom. And Gandhiji used to say that India lives in its villages, the soul of India is in the villages. And I had never seen a village in my life. Wow. So, uh, And I did not know the language of the state I was living in. As kind of a person living in Mumbai for many years, but not knowing good enough Marathi. And I felt that if I wanted to transform this country, I need to create a movement. Because till now, while India has been successful in movement, whether it is the Gandhiji's movement, or the one against emergency, or Mandir Mandal, or the latest Shanna movement, these movements have, are not very well thought through. So it's like going to break a building without having the blueprint or the plan to make a new one. So while the movements have been successful, India has not prospered because of the movement. So I felt, can we do a proactive, positive, non-confrontational, pro-developed movement in the villages? So I decided I would do that. And then I said, which villages? I was a, I was a complete outsider. So at that at that time, I used to read articles, see programs that Maratwada had the highest farmer suicides. Maratwada is a region in Maharashtra, which has 11 districts, sorry, 8 districts. 
So I said, which district should I go? So Bid was supposed to be the worst district in that. In that, there were a few talukas, but Parli Taluka probably had highest amount of lawlessness. So I thought maybe I should work in the worst area of the country, create a proof of concept so that it can be replicated and scaled up to transform this nation. And uh, not knowing the language, not understanding the people, and being a planner or a management person, I thought I would go there and make some minor changes and the whole country will change. So I went there and I quickly realized I know nothing. And I had to unlearn before I started learning. I had to throw the tea out of the cup before anything else came into the cup. So I sold out my house in Mumbai. I started living in the villages, trying to understand it. It took me some time. Very interesting, and I think the, the comment you made about movements, um, like being being a little focused on the immediate objective, but not like having a long term uh, transformation or empowerment plan in place, uh, is something very very interesting. Actually, uh, also yeah. you know movements movements have the power to take you out of money making, out of hedonism, to work for the nation or work for others. Right. For a campaign or a project or a program, you cannot do that. Then it's driven by your you and movements are driven by others. Right. That's amazing. Uh, you said you actually sold your house and uh, you need to do that. Obviously, your family has been a huge support in what you've been doing. Uh, yeah, oh, nothing, you nothing would have been possible without them. My wife is my inspiration. My children tell me, Papa, you dance to your own music. You do what you want. We are there behind you. So nothing would have been possible without them. That's amazing. I've had the good fortune of meeting your kids and I, I can see that they're following in your footsteps. Now, let me just, uh, I mean, you've you told me precisely what was wrong with uh, Parli village and uh, that district. I mean, that what drew you to it. I mean, the um, it was like the so-called basket case of that whole region. An uh, amazing place to start with. I mean, you could have possibly gone in and say, hey, I know not, uh, not too much about this whole sector. Let me go into something a little uh, easy for me to do and then we can move on. So what was that experience like? How did Parli happen? That whole transformation story is magical. But how did that happen? It mustn't have been easy, right? I think uh, I didn't find anything hard in life because I am not doing anything. Somebody up there is doing everything. So I don't take ownership of anything. I don't take ownership of consequences. I don't take ownership of success or failure. So it's just I'm just driven to do some things and somebody up there is doing it. Having said that, I must say that when I went to Parli, uh, Parli was a real, uh, really one of the worst areas that I have ever encountered in my life. The average monthly income was rupees 3,500. Youth had not tasted milk. The whole area was full of depression. You cannot consider government having... I mean, Government does nothing. You just put a cross on government. There were no NGOs. And people there were living because they were not dead. So that entire area, while the national uh, average irrigation area at that time was 40%, Parli was 1.72%. And I started by staying with the people there, especially going and meeting families who had committed suicides. And looking at the state, trying to analyze why do they do what they do. It's not as if a few hundred people commit suicide. That's the uh, that's the only size of the problem. The size of the problem is far bigger. If one person is committing suicide, five thousand other wants to commit suicide but don't have the. And you can imagine that you don't one day get up and commit suicide. You are dying every day for months and years on before you take the final step. And when I met them, when I saw the children, when I met the ladies, when I saw the people, how they were, I, I thought I should just devote my life to this. So I had no doubt in my mind that this could be the route to transform India. At no point did I go there to help farmers. At no point did I go there to help people in Parli. My, my target was how do I transform this country and do it through agriculture, through uh, Parli. If, if uh, that was not the case, if I did not think that is the way, I would have taken some other way. Because I feel that while you do education reforms, uh, healthcare, 
and many, many, many other things that people do. But those are things to manage people, to give them some happiness, take care. But if you want to transform the country, I honestly feel that there is only one way that one can transform this country and that is sustainable agriculture at scale. Unless you do sustainable agriculture at scale, you can't transform this country. All other things are small, small things which you must do. People do education, healthcare, uh, other reform, cleanliness, all of those are very important. But if you have the bigger goal of transforming this country completely, to bring it back to the days of Soneki Chidiya of economic resurgence, then sustainable agriculture, where 65 percent of the people live, that you have to change. And most importantly, you need to understand that youth have no interest in farming anymore. What is going to happen to this country in 20 years' time? And the only antidote to that, to the social unrest that happened in rural area, the suicides that happened, the, the all kind of avoidable miseries that take place, is to the only, only antidote is to increase the farming income. I see no other way. So I thought I should do this. It's very interesting, Mayank, because uh, if you see the trajectory of this country, especially in the last 20, 30 years, there seems to be more of an emphasis on uh, urbanization and, you know, urban infrastructure. Um, and and it, that's important. I mean, cities are important for any country. Uh, but what you are saying is, uh, I mean, the future of India and the uh, resilience and resurgence of India lies in actually the agrarian economy and uh, in agriculture. Uh, so let us just go back again to Parli. Um, it mustn't have been easy. You coming from a city like Mumbai, uh, obviously, you know, you were learning as you're going along trying to transform uh, the place. Um, uh, how was, what is the reception you got when you went there? I mean, were they, uh, were they, did they, because in an area of, I mean, in a, in a kind of an atmosphere of hopelessness, when, you know, people are committing suicide, uh, you have somebody coming out there saying, hey, you know, let's try and transform this. Uh, skepticism is probably, and cynicism is probably the first reactions. Uh, so okay. what is your, uh, what did you uh, encounter? You know, far farmers are used to a lot of people coming from urban areas and uh, uh, doing business, cheating them, doing sports. Really? So when we came, there was obvious uh, some skepticism. Fortunately, I came with a reputation. I was in the public life. I, I used to come on television every day. So people did not absolutely think that here is someone fraud. But he felt I, this guy must be coming here for either notes or votes. So that's the only two things that they know of. So it took me a lot of time. I used to tell them, listen, I'm uh, half crack. I'm mad. So <laughs> and, uh, my wife and children have kicked me out of the house. So I'm coming here to work. So they all used to laugh. But at some point of time, I think the faith started building as we did small. And we structured the whole thing that the low hanging fruit, the small victory started coming. Before we went into the, hit into the big time sustainable agriculture thing earlier, we did work on school, giving cycles to girls, filter, so many multiple things we did with farmers. So, and we, they, we were there for two, more than two years before they started having the confidence. Otherwise, they felt here is one fly by night, he will come talk and go away. So, it took some time. Fortunately, we had some people from that area who used to travel with us. So, Tehsildar was there. He was also very good. So, and I went every day, every day, every day. And finally, they had no uh, recourse but to believe in me. And uh, that was... And right now, it's a movement. People will go. When I go there, they will run after the car. They will come in thousands. So, it's changed. The whole scenario has changed. Wonderful. So, Mayan, can you literally talk us through the entire Parli, you know, miracle that happened? When did you actually start this and what were maybe the, the main phases of the transformation that took place in Parli? Naresh, you need, need to understand that I did not understand villages. Okay. So we'll have to start with that uh, premise. So I went there and I started working and staying with the villagers and started understanding the problem. And like a typical NGO or a typical uh, do-gooder, I started working on education, healthcare, uh, capacity building, income generation, water. There was, say, in eight years, there were six droughts. So water was very scarce. So I started working on a 360 degrees for 15 villages, which I had chosen, which were the worst. 
once i started doing that i i felt that they were completely depressed they, they just did not think anything can happen to their life so and one very important thing we need to know that the movement was not getting created men folk would come in their hundreds but there were no women who used to come to meet me or come in the meeting and without women and without music there is no movement possible and i used to wonder how do i crack this in 2017 in a small village called revli typically you know you have these small meetings in temple premises yeah and i was speaking at that temple premise in my broken marathi and somebody was speaking about me and i got irritated and i said at least don't drink and come into the temple after the meeting i felt i should not have said it publicly humiliating somebody mm. he must be somebody's brother somebody's uncle of that village but the sarpanch took it very seriously in the evening he went to a illicit uh, liquor shop and said mayank bhai is coming all the way from 530 kilometers seven people have died of cirrhosis of liver and uh, a woman had started drinking 10 year old had started drinking why don't you stop selling liquor and i don't know what happened it was twilight time and the shopkeeper said i have got 7 days worth of stock let me sell it and then i will stop selling liquor that's amazing so the sarpanch called me and i said this is a formula which i can use went to him uh, went to the shopkeeper next morning got his feet and said god has come within you well, how will you look after your family i'll give you three pregnant goats and after 7 days he stopped selling liquor i gave him the pregnant goats and i hit on to the formula and i started going village to village telling all the liquor shops giving them three pregnant goats and every evening we will go with a mashal so that burning sticks going across villages shouting daru bandi jali ch paye prohibition should happen and children women used to come with me and the woman would sit outside liquor shops and sing ram dhun and like that in 15 20 days complete sale of liquor stopped wow so while people who wanted to drink desperately went further away to drink but what really happened was the women started joining us they said here is our brother who has come all the way from mumbai we must go to him we must support him and then it turned out into a massive movement and i would re- really invite you and your uh, viewers to fix up a plan come there see the kind of transformation that has happened so then it became into a movement and i could see that in those soulless eyes i could see some spark and you know the outside is the manifestation of the inside so i thought here there was an opportunity people had started believing a little little about change so fortunately in 2018 uh, there was a big competition for creating water sources water harvesting in these 15 villages yeah. of course it was pan maharashtra mm-hmm. but all our 15 villages took part and then we created it through massive movement at 5:30 in the morning we would get everyone out of their house lock the house and uh, and they would come with all the tools and in 45 days in the scorching sun of april and may we created 70 kilometers of river and its tributaries we created 162 ponds we created 62 small check dams we created five big dams and many trenches so it was done mostly by this shramdan what they say by the people so at 532 Nine o'clock they would work because then the sun would overpower, and in the evening at six six thirty we start till one o'clock in the night. We worked like this for forty five days, and the transformation that it took place, not on the ground it, but in the heart in the minds of the people, was amazing. So, two hundred and twenty two crore liters of water was stored, and we felt, and I felt that storing water, giving water. harvesting is only step 1 unless you increase the income and by this time i had come to a realization which i'm sure you will not like to hear that education and healthcare is overrated if you are to increase the income 
or multiply the income the farmer has the capacity to look after the health care and the education of their children. So I felt that instead of doing all of these 360 degrees development, let me just focus. Because if I was doing 360 degrees development, then maybe in my lifetime I can do 15, 25, 50, maybe 100 villages. And India is 643,000 villages. How do I transform this country? So I pivoted and just took one point agenda, which was to increase farmer income in farmers' farms. So they were typically doing rice and cotton, which was not very remunerative. They used to get around 25 to 30,000 rupees per acre per year. So we went every evening, we would go with projector in every village and show the videos and tell them that they should change their cropping pattern and that they should go in for fruit plantation. So in the first year, 2019, we did 11.87 lakh plantation. In 2020-21, which were COVID years, we still managed to do 19 lakhs and 78 lakhs. In 2022, we did two, 210, uh, 2 crore 10 lakh fruits. Totally, we have finished 4.5 crore plants. And because of this, their incomes have multiplied. We had promised them that we will, from 25, 30,000, we will bring your income over 1 lakh. But we felt this is what we are saying. We need a third party impact assessment. So we have engaged Tata Institute of Social Science, the gold standard in all of these things, to do a survey to see how, how much incomes have increased because of our intervention. And I just got the report a few days back, which said that earlier, before our GVT's intervention, the incomes of far farmers was 38,600 per year per acre. And in about a year, year, year and a half, it has got to 3,90,000, 390,000. So a 10x increase in income across the board. In, uh, and now we are working in over 4,000 villages. So across so many villages in Maharashtra and Madhya Pradesh, a 10x is something that is unheard of. It seems to me also like unbelievable, even though I am the one who did it. Um, so uh, we, when we spoke earlier, I believe your team didn't, I mean, you kind of estimated that incomes had gone up maybe 2x or 4x. Uh, so the Tata Institute's uh, report, which you got a few days ago, uh, 10x is something magical. What do you think was, uh, I mean, this is not the standard uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, transformation theory that's ever taught anywhere. Uh, these are not kind of examples you see. There's something magical which happened, and not only in one or two villages, but in 4,000 villages. What do you think is a secret of that? Farmers income going up to 10x. In the there are three things. Hmm. When I looked at the what we were doing, I realized that there were three, I mean, planting fruit trees is not rocket science, which I discovered. But there were three gaps in that. One was that the quality of uh, plants that are given to farmers or the ones that they use needs to improve. So we purchased it from all over the country where the best fruit plants were there. And like in real estate, they say there are only three things which matter. Location, location and location. Yeah. I believed in farming, there are three things that mattered. Training, training and training. Okay. So we did massive training of our farmer. Every alternate day, we would be having training sessions from some of the experts in this country and outside. We also had some people from Netherlands come and teach. So we did this and I must, I can say with pride that maybe my farmers would be, would be one of the most knowledgeable set of farmers in this country. So we did a lot of trial and teaching, etc. We used a lot of technology. And most importantly, and I think this needs to be stated, uh, that in the first year, 2019, we did 146,000 papaya trees. Okay. Now, this papaya trees is just less than 1% of the Maharashtra's papaya trees. But because they were in a cluster and because they were in a scale, we found that buyers from all over the country would come here and purchase at very good price. So we realized that scale is the game. If we have scale, 
then our farmers don't have to get into the exploitative conditions of the market, but the market comes to us. That learning we took and then we did all this uh, 45 million trees. So this is, I think, the learning which got us this kind of earning. So uh, one thing about scale is, of course, I mean, uh, 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 market linkages or go to market is a very, very crucial link out here. I mean, there's always, we have had stories about uh, bumper crops, et cetera, et cetera, and absolutely no place to sell it. Uh, so it became yeah. counterproductive. How did you bridge that gap? I mean, obviously, uh, you said you, it was a pull factor that was created uh, by having such a large amount of produce in one small area. Uh, but how did you manage that market uh, linkage aspect? Of this? No, we connected with the entire market, with all the traders, and we told them what is available. And the quality of fruits were very good in that area. So we did not really need to do so much. The traders come came to us when they heard that this is the quality that is available and give a good price at the farm gate. So farmers really did not have to go to the market. So that I thought was one of the biggest lessons that we learned. That's amazing. And uh, we also hear about, uh, you know, this whole aspect of the middleman. Uh, the middleman who traditionally, uh, in this country especially, uh, has been the roadblock to farmers really getting the due for their efforts and, you know, the, all the hard work they put in. How did you tackle that aspect? See, it's not uh, that there were no middlemen in what we were doing. We don't really expect a shopkeeper to come there and buy. There will be some layers. Yeah. But many layers got cu cut when the real person who was supplying to the retailers came and bought directly, aggregated all the fruits and sold it directly to the trader, to the retail. So that cut down a lot of layers. Okay. That's great. Uh, you right at the, at the beginning, I think what uh, maybe that this is where maybe you didn't realize what a big role that was going to play. Uh, but when you uh, spend those initial hours in, you know, building up the, the irrigation systems in uh, in Parli and other villages, uh, uh, that technology you used, I, uh, we are fortunate enough that we are seeing a model of that on display at the Nehru Center at uh, you know, for the inaugural and the next day as oh, well. That, that, is, uh, that is another story and I think it needs to be said. Yes, uh, let's hear. In 2018, there, there was a huge drought and I was walking inside the river, a dry river, and I started thinking that the rain, uh, the water comes from top and then it goes down into the uh, soil and there are large lakes inside the earth's surface called aquifers, some of at 100 feet, some at 300. 100 feet one would be would get filled in 100 years time as the water seeps inside one feet in a year. And the 300 would be maybe 500,000 years back. And the 500 one would be when the earth's crust was formed. Yeah. So at that time, the water used to get filled and human beings with their intelligence, with their science would drill a hole into that aquifer and put a pump and pull it out in 20 seconds. So I said, uh, when I go up and somebody asked me, what is the balance sheet of how much you have exploited the earth and how much have you replenished it? So I said, is it possible that we can put back the water in 15 seconds rather than let it grow year by year? So in the heart of the river, we put one pump, put all the filter and as the river flowed, the water started going right inside and the aquifer at 100, 150 feet, which was empty, started filling and then we put 120 of these and every day 5,000 liters of water, every hour 5,000 liters of water would go in. So totally 1.44 crore liters of water would go for from one re recharge shaft. I call it GRA, Global River Aqua Shaft. And it would for, flow for four to five months. So all the water would accumulate down. So the water table which was at 400, 500 feet has now come to 20 to 30 feet. I must tell you a few stories about this. Please. This was so transformative that that brown, barren land became completely green. And five kilometers away, a bore well was there. Water started coming out automatically out of it. Last year, there was a there was a there was a small uh, village called Parchundi, which is next to that river. So they called me one day and said, sir, there is some problem. 
the earth is trembling and at night ghost sounds are coming so i got afraid and said we have stopped living in our house and we live in the fields so i got afraid did i do something which was not appropriate so i sent some geologist and we found out that because of so much water flowing inside the air in that aquifer wanted to come out okay so that's why the trembling used to happen and wherever there were crevices the air would come out in uh, full speed and making noises which they felt were ghost noises so and this year has been a severe drought in marathwada but all the villages which are on this river tell us that they have more water than last year also so this river richard shaft can actually transform this nation completely amazing so this model so i thought let me make a model and show how yeah. water is flowing and how it goes into the aquifer i think uh, tomorrow we will be able to see that in nehru center right so viewers this uh, this session has been recorded on the 14th of january so uh, we are looking forward to the inauguration on the 15th of the rise summit and that's where we'll be seeing the model i mean all those who are attending it uh, obviously i must also remind you that there are a lot of resource material on the work that mayank and the global uh, vikas trust have done uh, you can find it in the resource section of uh, the the rise uh, uh, platform uh, please do go through that uh, these fascinating stories are truly worth uh, uh, learning about so mayank uh, let's uh, go ahead now about this whole question of uh, sustainability uh, what you did uh, was amazing uh, a lot of human resource involved as well but surely a lot of financial resources were required as well uh, what kind of support did you receive for this uh, you, know, you know this initiative of yours so there are a lot of uh, industries which are supporting us through their csr and we have a very eminent board of advisors some of the top people in the industry who are part of us then is an ex uh, agriculture minister central agriculture minister for two terms there are experts from nabard from experts from uh, icar from different organizations with different skill sets who are guiding and helping us but financially we are getting a lot of support from industry through their csr funds so really finance, finance is not a serious problem to us though of course if we had more resources we could do more obviously but i guess uh... Uh, the fact that industry came forward to help uh, such a transformational uh, initiative. Uh, so, Ernst uh, so Young, HDFC Bank, and uh, Motilal also, also so many, sixty-three of them. Sixty-three. All, yeah, that's amazing. Because our documentation is very, very elaborate and detailed. So even an organization like Ernst and Young came and said that what you have, I mean, they increased their support by three times. So there is a lot of accountability there's a lot of transparency in what we do and that has helped us gain confidence from all sides now uh, you of course uh, what you did in parli and the villages around didn't remain there uh, it's now replicated in 4000 villages in maharashtra and madhya pradesh so the, what is the element of replicability out here uh, you i think uh, you are uh, very sure that this could be a model which could be taken across india uh, what is the factor that makes this replicable? So, the fact that we are not married to fruit trees. We are married to one lakh rupee per acre. So, okay. every area has their own selection of plants and trees and uh, things like that. To, so, it's not one model which works in Parli will work across Mar in Madhya Pradesh. Madhya Pradesh needs to have another model. Palgar, for example, will not have any fruits. It will have jasmine flowers. So, different kinds. So, we have a team of 180 agronomists. So, we do a lot of detailed study before we choose the area where we want to work. Just with this sole aim of ensuring that a farmer should earn at least 1 lakh rupee per acre. And you have seen that they are right now earning 3 lakh 90,000. But 1 lakh is our baseline. So, I don't want to commit more and deliver less. I want to commit less and deliver more. So, there are, of course, multiple factors, training modules, plantation, how to handle the soil, how to handle things. So, there is a great amount of science and knowledge into this, which we impart to the farmers regularly. So, at the village level, what is the kind of uh, ownership that they have taken of this entire initiative? 
uh, how is it sustainable at the village level? I mean, I know there's training but is something which uh, you if depend you want to, If you want to change this country, then you cannot go and change it. Hmm. You have to get the farmers to become part of this whole thing. As I keep on saying, this is your problem. You have to carry it. I will only come and give you a shoulder for a while. Then it's your baby. You have to carry it. So we don't really get too detailed into it. Farmers, the Indian farmers are probably the best species in this world. They are, they are, they are so resilient. They are so hardworking. They can take new technology. There is so much. They just need some support which we have given. And once we give support, then we move on. So it's not as if we go deep, deep, we can. We can go deeper, what we are doing, we can do still more. But then uh, our, the trade-off is that we will lose other farmers. So we do a minimal amount of support, get them out of the poverty trap and then move on. <coughs> Sorry. So the farmers can look after themselves. No, but no, there's no need for us to babysit them. So that brings me to uh, the repli replicability question again. As you know, RISE attracts a global audience. Uh, even now, as we speak, we are more than 7,000 uh, participants who are joining in from 70 countries. Uh, do you think this model is something which can be, and I know that the Parli initiative has been lauded and uh, has uh, been, uh, you know, has received accolades, not only in India, but across the world, even at the UN level. So uh, do you think the replicability of this model is uh, is possible in other countries as well? Or this is very unique to India, what you have done and what you've seen? No, I think there are so many common factors that can go across the world. So, so what we have done is, because I'm working in 4,000 villages, and India has 643,000 villages. The rest of the world would have multiple more times. So how do you scale it up? So right now we are doing a push theory. We go to the to villages which are poor and help them increase their income. But we need a pull theory. So we are making a world-class training center, which will be an incubation center for three of the biggest problems in the world. One is we have shown through the proof of concept that one can multiply their incomes. We have seen 10 times, but assuming even four times, so this becomes the training center which will attract, like a magnet, attract farmers from all over the country and all over the world. And we will train them to ensure. And I am not one for education. So there are thousands of uh, agri-colleges where children of farmers come, they do a two to four year course and then take up a job either in government or in multinationals or in fertilizer company. And no, nobody goes back to his farm to work. So then 9.5 crore farmers, who is going to help them? So our model is going to be a training module and not an education module. If somebody wants to get educated, there are, there are many thousands of colleges. So we want to look after the farmers who are already farming and try to increase their income, train them. So one incubation center, one of the is poverty, which we hope to create an incubation center for. The second, which is most important and which I did not allude to in our earlier conversation, was changing from crops to trees has a huge impact on the environment. So 4.5 crores, 45 million trees has attracted the monsoon, attracted the rainfall, and areas which had six crops in eight years, for the last four years, it's been raining heavily. So environment, birds, bees, plantation, greenery, everything has changed. So with one stone, you are killing many, many problems. So second part is enhancing the environment because I believe that the easiest, cheapest and fastest way to fight the climate crisis is mass plantation of trees. The third one is the soil, the poisonous soil that we do, the kind of fertilizers that we use, and we are killing millions and millions of microbes in one. I mean, there are millions of microbes in one spoon of uh, soil. And when we put this urea and all other chemicals, we are killing them and we are eating food made out, made out of that soil. Because as is the soil, so is the mind. As is the mind, so is the world. So 
this stress, this uh, fragmentation, this frustration, I believe somewhere is connected to the kind of food that we eat because we are what we eat. So how do you change that? So we have a model created by somebody else where they used cow based uh, bio enhancers composted mm -hmm. and they use it to plant trees to put it in the soil and we are creating an incubation center and I must say that we have had an increase of 20 to 100 percent increase in production at fraction of the cost. So here is a model which has the seeds to transform the way crops are grown not just in India but all over the world. So these are the three major problems that we think we can tackle in this training center that we are making. Wonderful. And I think you called it Trishikul, right? And there's yeah. a story behind that as well. Oh, no, no. In the earlier times, there used to be punch kul, five kuls. Yeah. Gurukul, guru kul, Ruksh kul, some other kul and Krishikul. Okay. So we have called it Krishikul that we think that here is where we will teach about agriculture in the right way. We are doing a lot of irrigation practices which are one of the finest. We are doing a lot of plantation, harvesting, which is the best practices from the world we are taking and trying to implement. So when, when a lot is of this... lot of technology we are using. Yes, sorry. Okay. So when when is this first Trishikul going to be inaugurated? Uh, we are expecting it to to inaugurate it in the end of February this year. Excellent. And um, so this is an invitation to all our viewers and all the participants at RISE to actually, uh, you know, plan a visit to Krishikul. Um, we have... Uh, Absolutely. We welcome all of you. There is no charge, no cost, except the fact that you have to reach there. We can tell you how to reach there. And uh, come and stay there. We have staying accommodation also. And we have cows and you can build the cows, do some irrigation plant the trees. So, and of course, pluck all the fruits. We have 21 kind of fruits. Okay. That's wonderful. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you can click on the link given in the description of this session and, uh, you know, register for this. Of course, you know, there'll be a huge waiting list, I'm sure. But I'm sure Mayank and the Global Vikas Trust team will do their best to facilitate your visit to uh, Krishikul. And I think nothing better than actually seeing the magic that has been uh, that's happened in Parli and other villages firsthand, and actually getting trained uh, in in case that's what your uh, you know intention is, and take the story of, uh, far and wide. So I wish you all the very best for Krishikul Mank. I think it's a brilliant initiative, and a great way to you know to sustain this uh, the you know the transformation that has happened in these villages. That's just one more thing. Yes. If there's a group which wants to do it in their area. <laughs> Then uh, we have a one and one to one and a half month training session, and we will also give one person for handholding them for the next few months. So okay. we want to replicate this all over the country, and wherever people are interested in. And I'm sure I don't know if any single place in this country where they earn so much. So I'm sure there is this demand for increasing the incomes of the farmer across the country. And we would love to train people who can go and do it back in their areas. So, Bank, uh, when we met last, you said the government of India has also shown interest in taking this uh, beyond uh, Maharashtra and Madhya Pradesh, right? I mean, there have been some... Uh... So there are conversations at different levels. But because nothing is still closed, mm -hmm. it's not right time to talk about yeah. it. Yeah. But there is a huge interest across state governments and central government. That's great. So I really wish... Uh, I wish you all the best for that and you know, I wish for this uh, initiative to really take uh, birth and grow much beyond what you've already done because uh, it, it is depressing to, to read about farmer suicide still in this day and age uh, when we're talking about becoming the third economy, third biggest economy in the world. Uh, I think our farmers are what, what have taken us this far and it's only right that we do good by them and I think what you are doing is really an example of that. There is no option. And like in a marathon, the last 300 meters, you run fast. Yes. In my life's marathon, I've started running fast. Let's transform this country. Well, I, I don't think you've come anywhere close to the end of that marathon. We want you to go on and on and on. So as in our concluding uh, uh, session, part of this uh, session, um, a personal question. I mean, ever since I've known you, and it's almost 25 years that we know each other, I've always noticed that, uh, you know, Spirituality has been a part of who you are and what you do, uh, whether it was, uh, you know, your activism, whether that it was your experiment in political renaissance, 
despite all the experiences you had. You held on strong to spiritualism. And I was a little alarmed at one point when you said that you were ready to take sannyas and, you know, literally move away from the world. I'm so glad you didn't do that. Um, so uh, personal question, how much, what does spirituality mean to you? And how, what, uh, what does it, how does it help you when you go about and, you know, try to create these, uh, this transformation in the lives of people? I'll be very candid with you. First of all, I don't like defining and discussing about spirituality. Mm -hmm. But I feel I am living spirituality. We all are living spirits. We don't recognize it. And our brain is coming in the way all the time. So I, I give a rest to my brain. And when I meditate, I get whatever answers are there from the top. My only thing is, is not to put my... Against the divine intelligence, I don't let my small intelligence interfere. So all that message that I get, everything that I get comes from top. I just execute it. I am so fortunate and blessed that I am an instrument that he is using for betterment of this world. So I believe that humans live in three planes of consciousness. First plane is the mind-body complex which we are living day to day. And the second one is because we are connected with everyone else, their pain, their problems, we try to solve in the best possible way without getting directly involved. And the third plane of consciousness is when we connect to the divine power, the divine energy that is there. So I am fortunate that I am living on all three planes of consciousness. I live for myself. I have a great life. I try to help others as much as I can. And of course, I connect with the divine because from there the entire strength and the source comes from. That's amazing. That's truly empowering. Um, so as, uh, on a parting note, uh, where do you see Global Vikas Trust uh, in the next 10 years? Uh, what do you see uh, it doing uh, apart from what they, they're already doing right now in terms of village transformation? Aresh, I am convinced that sustainable agriculture at scale is the only way this country can transform. I will continue to do this and I will keep on increasing the scale getting more and more players involved, trying to reach out to maximum amount of people in this country and outside to see that this is the way this country, this earth can change. Especially the part in which the lesser use of chemicals for production in our body. I think that's the way to go ahead. I will continue to do that. And like I said, I will run faster and faster as the finish line comes. <laughs> Well, I really hope the finish line is way, way away, but I, I hope that you really uh, keep running faster. Uh, we need more of you and uh, we need more of what's been uh, done in Parli and all these other villages. Uh, finally, uh, what message would you like to give our participants uh, who are joined in here and who will be uh, watching this uh, even in the recorded form for the next several months? What message would you like to leave for them? It's a bit controversial. Uh -huh. but. There are very few people who want to work for the nation or for others. Only maybe a few thousand, 50,000 or 100,000 people. Don't do small work. Don't do what we call chindi gam mat karo. So yes. somebody will say, I am saving plastic. Somebody will say, I am saving water. I switch off the tap. The size of the problem is so large that if you want to tackle that problem, your size of the solution has to be larger than that. So whatever you do, do in scale, do it, do large. Don't do these small, small things and say, at least I'm doing what I can do. You can do far more than what you can, you are, you think you can do. Your Lakshman Rekha, your border, your boundary, you are drawing it smaller and smaller. Make it very large. Look at the world, look at the country and try to solve in the big way rather than doing all these small, small chindi work. This is my message. People may not like it, but that's how I think. I think I think your message will be taken very well. Uh, I think everybody is looking for transformation in a massive way, and uh, while we want everybody to do their bit, uh, I think you know your story and your life uh, actually is an inspiration. How everybody can aspire to do much bigger than what they are right now, and I think in a way uh, this is what Rise has also tried to do over the last uh, eleven years uh, of you know collaborative uh, collaborative effort across sectors, across borders. It's only when people join hands that the small bit that you're talking about can become massive. 
And uh, that is what we've been trying to do through RISE. Uh, so thank you, Mayank Gandhi. So ladies and gentlemen, that was Mayank Gandhi. Uh, thank you. Man, thank you so much. Yeah, a man of many parts, but somebody who's always tried to transform society in whatever he's tried to do. And I think with uh, what he's doing right now, uh, the Parley experiment or the initiative is no longer an experiment, uh, is, is absolutely transformational. It's, it's bound to impact this country in ways that we, we can't even imagine right now. So once again, uh, thank you, Mayank, for your time. Uh, it's been an inspiration. I've known you for, like I said, nearly 25 years, but oh, yeah. I feel that I know a hugely new aspect of you uh, than I knew before. So thank you for being so candid. And, oh, yeah. and uh, again, a request to all our uh, viewers, please do uh, you know catch Mayank at uh, other sessions that he's a part of uh, through RISE. Do look into the resource segment and uh, go through all the documents that are available on the Parley Initiative, as well as the, the, the water harvesting and uh, Krishikul uh, concept. And yes, do sign up to visit Krishikul and Parley at the first instance you get. Uh, early February is what we're expecting Krishikul to actually you know, be inaugurated at. But uh, we will be informing you about it. At least sign up and uh, Mayan's team will be more than happy to welcome you. So thank you once again. This was the Fireside Chat with the amazingly inspirational and dynamic Mayan Gandhi. Thank you and enjoy the summit. Thank you very much. Thank you.